few years ago, over a decade, I came out of that sailing race on crutches. A piece of steel cable went through my heel, and I blamed the world, the other boat, the cable manufacturer, and like all sailors, I whined and didn't take responsibility. So today is a different day. I'm here from a theoretic point of view to make amends. It's actually me who caused it. It was my hubris. I was overzealous. I didn't realize that I hadn't slept enough. I hadn't taken my food. I was out of calories. And on the moment that it really mattered, just before that finish line, I should have done the wiser thing and step aside. Step aside and let a fitter, better man take over. Now, the year after, we learned our lesson. We made sure we slept better, we were proactively in our food intake, and we won that race. But it didn't have to happen. And with today's artificial intelligence, I'm going to make my amends here. I've learned from it. And with today's technology, I should actually know proactively and predict if I could take that or step aside. So let's take this a notch further. Let's go to the Volvo Ocean Race, one of the toughest, toughest races in the world. And on top of it, it's final this year. The 30th of June is going to be here in the Netherlands in The Hague. So that ocean race goes over four oceans. It has a series of challenges. It has seven boats, seven teams. And I don't know if you guys know, but the boats are all identical. Fully identical boat. Same design. Now, the only thing that makes a difference is the crew. So what happens the moment you start actually helping the crew and powering them up with biometric sensors so they have insight in their sleep, in their food intake, and in their energy? So the most important is that the team actually predictively knows when to act and when to restore. The crew gaining insight in their own pattern is all what it's about. Artificial intelligence is actually all about taking one part of my shoulders that I actually don't have the time for or that is too repetitive or brain numbing. In this case, to make better decisions. And for those of you who love sailing and actually saw that nail-biting final in Auckland, where the Exo Nobel boat with SAP's biometrics on it really made it just in time. Everything the skipper said is, I am so proud of my crew. They never flinched. In the end, like every process in the world, it's the human being that makes the difference. But data changes everything. Now, if you take that, we're moving at this moment from a more process-driven world to a data-driven world. And data actually allows us to change the way we do. We can change the order instead of more linear. We can work more parallel. We can use technology that actually reads our receipts for our expenses and fills in that expense form instead of having to type it in. So we can change our processes in our organization, but AI, AI actually helps us to understand the data and goes to this massive amount and answer those data questions. Now, under that are actually three things that have been changing. One, we have gone from human to machine, right? Human-machine handover of tasks, it means that a lot of little tasks, more and more, are done by technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence. But what's really important there is tasks from people that are higher educated, knowledge workers, knowledge professionals, accountants, auditors, merchandisers, procurement, things that required a, a tough education and training are slowly taken over. Second is, we see more a transition from product to platform. 
if you look at the operations that the Amazons and the Alibabas and the Etsy's and, and eBay have taken over, you and I can start a shop tomorrow. We can sit in the back and we actually never touch any of our inventory, we never touch any of the shipping labels, and we use those platforms to run our business. There's no way we would have done it 20 years ago. And the third is innovation is changing. Well, in the old days, up till last year, companies used to do everything inside in their house, etc. What they now do is we share, we co-innovate, we co-innovate with our clients, we, we co-innovate with consumers, we do crowdsourcing to train technology. Three serious fundamental shifts. So when you look at that and you look to SAP, SAP is the largest software enterprise application company in the world. 77% of the world's transactional revenue goes through SAP. When I say the world runs on SAP, that's not a statement, that's a fact. Our customers produce 78% of the world's food, 82% of the world's medical devices. We have an ecosystem of more than 16,000 partners. That means when these companies and their companies, we're talking about millions of companies touched by our technology, millions of knowledge workers using that technology, we had this like, we need to move on and we need to co-innovate with them. So what we did is we created this digital innovation system called Leonardo. It's a business innovation system. What we did is we took a bunch of technologies, some of ours, some that's on the market, and say, can we bring them together and pre-train them? Pre-train them with how do you solve a business problem in a industry and focus not on making the technology or making the machine learning by our clients, but our clients using that to get business outcomes. Now, for that, we need to go for one second in lecture mode, and what the heck is artificial intelligence? Let me just dumb this down. Artificial intelligence is not what we read in the sci-fi books. It's going to take a long while to get there, if ever. What it is, it's a bunch of technologies. It's a stack of technologies, a set of technologies that I infuse with knowledge, examples of how in an industry I will solve a business problem. And I do that to take one tiny task out of a knowledge worker or a professional shoulder to augment it, so you do the work, but I'll still approve, or you automate it, thank you for doing this. Because in between a lot of software, and especially ERP software that runs companies, there's still a lot of processes that human beings need to step in. So having said that, where do you start? Well, of course you start with machine learning, not, not just because we're on the machine learning track here, but because it allows you to be so much more flexible to train and to deal with changes, changes in your examples, changes in your material. And you train it the same way as you would train a new hire. Somebody comes out of college who knows everything and is useless until you teach them the secret sauce of how you do it in your company. And why do you start with conversational bots? Well, when you look at the research and you look at practical life and you combine them together, you'll see that millennials do not read their emails. Millennials hardly pick up their phones. And what we see in the United States is that conversational bots, chatbots with AI, are the best way for a company actually to serve their customers, to deal with their complaints, to give them answers on questions, to help them to do their payments, to make them book their tickets. So what we see is that all these things in repetitive work are really under challenge. Let, let's be clear. I mean, I, I don't know if there are any accountants or lawyers here in the room, but nobody went for four years to college, three years to law school, passed the bar, to become a regulatory lawyer, which is a really cool job, if you wouldn't spend 80% of your day going to a contract, matching it to the terms and conditions of a product, and cut and pasting the result in a spreadsheet. And the last 20% of your time, you're doing the cool stuff. Nobody really went to become an accountant and then work with an admin team to spend 75% of their days in reconciliation of invoices to figure out who paid what and what didn't they pay and how much do we owe them or they owe us. Serious people. I don't know if you guys do expense management, but one of the things I hate with expense management is I have the receipts, and then I'm becoming a data entry person, which you always, for some reason, have to do online, by typing in everything that's on that receipt already. Can't you just snap a picture, read the receipt, fill in my form, and I'll just approve? 
So we see literally that, th that those kind of data tasks are real candidates for replacement through our artificial intelligence. Now, the other thing that we see is that by 2035, and that seems really far away, eh? but this is closer than you think. By 2035, the bulk of tasks in accountancy and service and legal will be taken over by artificial intelligence. So a lot of people say, oh my god, that's really bad. No, that's not. Because you're now actually going to use people's brain for the best that they have. Historically, we have seen in situations where technology, new technology came in, whether it was a car, electricity, the steam engine, the internet, that in the beginning there was a dip, and suddenly it created new jobs. Think about all the jobs that the internet created. And those new jobs have always been driving economic growth. Now, the thing is, we can do, this is the hope, we can do things that machine learning can't. Let's go back to the topic of the day, microwaves. Some of you can remember, 1943, Second World War, the RAF was working on a better radar system to make sure that certain rockets on its way to England would not stay under the radar. And in a room this size was Percy Spencer, and Percy Spencer worked at that moment with a setup of radar technology, microwave technology, he was sitting behind the screen there every time he started this experiment, and he was offered his monthly ration of a bar of chocolate. And that bar of chocolate melted. And in 1946, the first patent was filed for the microwave. No machine learning ever will be taking one data point out of the topic of engineering, apply it for food, and realize, my god, microwaves are maybe, maybe pretty crap to find something under the radar, but man, do they heat food. So we need to keep in mind that human creativity is really something that machines can't take over. So let the robots do the heavy lifting and let the humans do the processing. And to make this really clear in the quote of John F. Kennedy, I believe that the technology that we create, that man creates to reduce jobs, that that same talent that we have to invent that technology with, that same talent we can actually create new jobs. So let's take this a notch further. Who, who's doing this today? Who's making money out of this? Well, first, you need to look at this. What is changing, right? From the 60s and the 70s, the different ways of looking from industrial automation to business process automation or, or more digital, we see a reduction of automating, of data entry from typing to word processing. We see AI now taking over repetitive tasks more than ever, more of a normal software could do that. And we see an increase in high-value tasks understanding I can make a microwave instead of just doing the experiment with radiation. So AI, first and foremost, won't impact employees. AI will impact employers and the change in the business model even more before it will impact employees. And it is really time for every organization, for every enterprise to think, let's think about the internet when we weren't doing anything until Amazon, and eBay, and all these companies had taken over our business and we had to reinvent ourselves. Maybe it is time to start thinking now about how AI machine learning can help me to do things different, to mobilize and free up the talent of my best people. And in that, we did some research. Um, last year's annuals of, of American companies, the published annuals, 22% of those annuals contribute profit and growth to some kind of use of artificial intelligence or machine learning. So we went together with the Economist Intelligence Unit in it, and we, we as SAP said, hey, we like to know, how do you use our technology, how do you use AI to get that growth? And we identified a segment of companies that was really successful. We called these companies fast learners. And in these fast learners, we saw that they have five traits. One, and this isn't as obvious, they actually had visionary top management. I let that sink in for a second. Visionary, it's no oxymoron mostly. But they had, they had top management that says, we are not going to use this technology for cost cutting. We are going to use this technology to create value. The second is, they had the attitude to say at the top management, we're not going to reduce but 75 of the companies that, percent of the companies that we interviewed, we said we're going to retrain our best people to make use of that free capacity that they're going to get because of the technology. 
What we saw is that those companies are also saying, we're going to deploy this enterprise-wide. We're not going to take one little business unit or one little domain, but we're going to make sure, sure, sure that this actually is something we can scale out. So an example, like, for instance, Intel, the chip maker realized that instead of doing the sales process and the qualification process the way they used to do, by changing the order and taking external data and letting AI filter out what was happening, they were lowering the time wasted on accounts that weren't up to it. They were realizing which contracts were up for renewal and proactively started anticipated what was happening with that client and changed their sales process in such a way that the salespeople got happier, made more money, drove more profit, and were faster to listen to their clients. So these five traits, when you bring them together, you'll get some impact. You get some serious impact. When you look at these numbers, these are serious numbers of growth, right? Faster processes, more impactful profitability and cost savings, but the most important, happier customers. Now, let's be very clear, right? There's no better source for profit. I believe it's the only source for profit than a customer, un unless you're the IRS, of course. They have another model. But the point there is, when you think customer first, and you start applying that on your processes, that's really what the key is. They took the processes close to home, physical close to home, that touch the clients. That doesn't always have to be sales. That can be procurement, that can be um, merchandising, that could be production. But they took these processes that hit their clients and worked with their clients and took the knowledge from their clients to improve things. So if you want this recipe, this real recipe for change, right? There's four things that were identified. Are you able to think outside in? Are you able to really do what they call design thinking and let go of everything you've done before and say, if I was doing this from scratch, if I was taking myself out of business, how would I do this? The second is, are you able to identify innovative technology but reduce the risk? Am I going to work with everything that is basically in code or am I going to work with players that already have created technology, pre-trained that with examples of my industry. Not only can I compare two documents, or can I do a chat, but can I do a chat about telecommunication in a customer service situation? Or can I compare two financial documents? Because it sounds really boring, but if you are able to bring a company up from, for instance, 20% compliant to 100% compliant, because people do not continuously have to compare risk models, you know what that really means in financial services? That means that you and I get our mortgage within two days instead of one month. And that's really what the, the competitive advantage is. So are you able to rethink your process, understand where you're going to put the technology, and in which parts of the stack under AI you're going to orchestrate, that one output is the input of the next, and understand which person, you, is actually able and competent to drive that. Because if you really want to foster innovation with less risk, you're going to need your best people to actually drive that. So you need to do one thing first to get your best people off their mind-numbing, repetitive tasks. So you want to innovate for value? I have a very, very simple question for you. How will you drive change? Thank you very much.